Okay. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks very much for showing. It's particularly the context of learning yes. that I'm interested in. Um, and the plan for the talk uh, today is that I'll talk for you know, about 20 minutes probably, uh, going through my Cole's research to really bring out uh, the fact that consciousness is a problem. And then um, I will run through a range of about 10 different conceptions or approaches to context uh, by, by people, followers of Vygotsky, of Vygotsky himself, through to uh, quite uh, distant current to try and, and give uh, a rounded picture of how context can and must be dealt with, and then I'll move to make some uh, claims about context. Okay? So, we begin in 1963, 25-year-old uh, old Mike Cole um, is drafted in to a team uh, tackling the education problems in Liberia. Uh, Mike Cole, at the time, had no experience in field work, uh, no uh, knowledge of educational psychology or development psychology, and didn't really know where to find Liberia on the map. But it was probably, I mean, they got him there. Um, his, in retrospect, he found it was an advantage to be a total outsider. The um, conventional wisdom among developmental workers at the time was that African children suffered from a long list of perceptual and intellectual difficulties. Uh, so to the extent they could not be expected to solve a simple, simple jigsaw puzzle and given a choice would always resort to memorising uh, rather than understanding. And the, the visits to schools that they made seemed to confirm this belief. Uh, Mike saw children learning to recite long passages of European poetry which they had no understanding of at all and even trying to memorise the answers to arithmetical exercises. But coming from the US at that time, when the civil rights movement was in full flow and was vigorously challenging all sorts of racial prejudices, uh, Mike was convinced that these, there had to be another explanation for what he saw. That uh, it could not be, um, he did not believe that uh, African children were suffering from an intellectual deficit. But nevertheless, he had to confront what he saw before he his eyes. So what the, the team uh, did was that they began by observing local uh, capella people uh, in their daily life to see if they really were that dumb. Uh, and what they observed was uh, people rapidly and accurately carrying out complicated calculations in the marketplace, buying and selling produce in a range of units, taxi drivers buying them with considerable skill, taking a wide range of cost factors into account, uh, people playing a board game called Balan, uh, exercising sophisticated uh, strategies and old men using arcane language skills and mobilising logical arguments in their performing their civic duty of uh, dispute resolution. So clearly, the capella were not done. Yeah? The team then set about trying to find an approach, a variety of approaches to testing the capella children uh, so as that their obvious intelligence could be manifested in a testing environment. They uh, used uh, tests that, that were routine in America and they uh, tried substituting uh, artifacts in the test uh, for um, uh, artifacts and tasks that were uh, indigenous to the Capella culture. And they also incorporated tests of the kind that Luria had used in 1931 in his uh, expedition to um, Uzbekistan which were uh, logical things, you know, if, if all bears are white, what colour is a polar bear? And the people there would say, I don't know, I've never been uh, to the North Pole. Yeah. Uh, so you tried uh, tests like this. Now, over a period of 10 years, the work uh, can be summarised as follows. In tests where the subjects had to estimate uh, relative quantities of rice in a variety of odd-shaped bowls and tins, the Capelli people, uh, which the Capelli routinely do in their marketplace transactions, Capelli children and adults regularly outperformed Americans. It seemed to confirm that using artifacts which are indigenous to a culture, carrying out tasks which are indigenous to their culture, people display the same level of skill as any other people. Uh, he also devised a cross-cultural experiment using uh, leaves from either trees or vines. And uh, the children were given 
tasks to recognize which was from a vine and which was from a tree, and then use that information to solve our puzzles, which were based on fictional criteria. Uh, what he found was the, uh, the Capelli outperformed uh, their American equivalents in all these tasks, but the Capelli didn't seem to be able to use the uh, knowledge they had of leaves in order to solve problems based on fictional criteria. Carl's team conf uh, concluded this, that cultural differences in cognition reside more in the situations to which particular cognitive processes are applied than in the existence of a cognitive process in one cultural group and its absence in another. Undoubtedly, though, differences in experience resulting from cultural differences could be reflected in specific cognitive differences. They're specific. Schooling in particular, he found, induces people to organise disjointed information in order to remember it later. And even a few years at elementary school would foster school-like abilities which could be used in other contexts. In the parents in Liberia, for example, do not ask their children questions just to hear the answer. And nor do they um, uh, make counterfactual statements just because they follow logically from other statements. Okay, so schools would give people uh, skill in these kind of practices. But these are practices uh, which are associated uh, specifically with schooling and with life in uh, the bureaucratic and industrial world. Cole also began to see that their own test procedures, even though they'd, they'd got rid of the, the American content, the very procedures themselves then were covert models of schooling practices. So all these tests that were being done on children, all they were telling you was the extent to which the children had been encultured to school. They told you absolutely nothing about uh, a child's intelligence. But that still leaves uh, us with a problem that uh, how can you I mean, what is it about the context which is uh, determining how um, things are interpreted? Right? Because you st even though you've discovered or proved that uh, the context determines the, um, how things are interpreted and uh, the, how intelligence is manifested, you're still facing the fact that if uh, people from uh, cultures that are systematically excluded from the benefits of modernity uh, how they to overcome that, right? and, and that's not uh, necessarily solved here. What was it about the context which rendered actions meaningful, and how could uh, these differences be overcome? Right? Now, the team did discover that uh, however poorly the Capella children uh, performed in their school tasks, schooling attendance at school did have an impact. Specifically, for example, the uh, women who would go on after school in their normal, traditional roles as mothers and farmers acquired uh, an understanding of how to deal with uh, school-like activities and their children benefited through um, uh, with, uh, lower rate of infant mortality, better health and when the children went to school they uh, had some understanding of these peculiar practices of hypothetical questions and uh, such like. Yeah. Counterfactual question. Uh, Michael gets back to San Diego. He's facing similar problems in his own district of a large, large section of the population being systematically excluded. So how to introduce the benefits of education uh, to people who are barred from it? The next step then was he, his team uh, got permission to go into classrooms with the video cameras and start videoing what was going on in American classrooms. This came to a very sudden end though, uh, because the teachers uh, refused to allow the dysfunctional uh, state of their classrooms to be recorded. Yeah? It's in the book where I'm taking this from, it's not spelled out, yeah? but I was making a separate communication with Mike, he said, well that's the truth of it, they didn't want us recording uh, how hopeless their uh, teaching was and how they were failing to teach children. Better to keep it secret. So the conclusion that you're then left with is the only way 
to learn about learning is not to treat the teachers and the learners as the objects of your research program, but to set up a school and help children learn. So long as the participants in your research program, which are widely called subjects in the, you know, the traditional scientific language, are really just rats, you know, being led through uh, mazes and so on, you can't expect their cooperation and uh, you can't expect their understanding of what you're doing. In order to enhance, you ask, well, how can we get the cooperation of the teachers and the kids to learn about learning? You, you have to um, help the kids learn and thereby engage them and then you can learn to do it better. And that's the only way of learning about learning. The next question then was, uh, Mike got out the uh, books and searched around uh, the, the history of, of education in America for the previous century and found lots of instances of really hopeful looking initiatives that have been carried out in order to overcome these barriers. The point was that none of them existed any longer. Every one of these great projects that have been started to uh, you know, reach out to people who have been excluded had uh, disappeared. So in order to solve this problem, uh, sustainability had to be uh, a key criteria. Um, another reflection. The most likely outcome of educating children in Liberia was in fact the alienation of the children from their parents in their own community. And I mean, I immediately understood what this means because I don't know how many times uh, in the Australian context you find that the uh, children of uneducated immigrants that have come to the new country to make a future for their family, you know, they succeed, their children not only get through school, make it into universities, take on professional jobs, and then they don't talk to their parents. They have no relationship with their parents, and it's a really sad fact. The, the, the key to this fact, though, is that you can't just deliver education to an, an individual. Uh, an individual is a part of a community, and only uh, if the community, or parents, the family, and, and whoever the power figures are within that community, are participants in your objective to educate the children, can you succeed? All these other initiatives, uh, while risking alienating the children from their own community, found that they had alienated the community, and the community was very powerful, and they have been finished. Yeah? Communities uh, have political voice, they have uh, influence of all sorts of kinds, and every one of these efforts to pluck a young children out, a child out of a, you know, a black ghetto in the States, for example, uh, had been shot down. Yeah? So, Mike was also concerned with this uh, fact, what's called ecological validity. It, to what extent is what happens in the classroom in any way relevant or transportable to the outside world? I mean, it's used in connection with scientific experiments. To what extent does this experiment uh, replicate what happens outside the laboratory? The same is true with education. What we teach the children, it's, and if we teach them you know, to be good school children and say the right thing and do the right things out of school, to what extent does that prepare them for the world outside? Clearly, uh, the results of the termination of these uh, projects, what look good, uh, reflects that it wasn't ecologically valid in that sense. So, how was he to proceed? Um, his, uh, he, Mike proceeded to engage uh, his university, um, the local library, uh, boys and girls club, um, I remember them all, a daycare centre, the local elementary school, and committees uh, representing the interests of parents in the projects uh, around, around the environs of the university. And they talked and talked and talked for a year to try and work out um, an activity which would benefit the children intellectually, teach them in other words, allow them to learn, which met the interests and the perspectives of all these interested parties. And uh, they developed a thing called uh, Fifth Dimension, uh, which in fact by the time it was implemented, uh, both the Day Ken Centre and the Boys and Girls Club who were going to host the centre uh, found that they couldn't uh, maintain it. It did, did not fit in with their own objectives. But the library uh, embraced it. And it's now, um, uh, 1987 to now, 
is that um, oh, 24 years and it still exists and has replicated itself in a number of uh, copycat centres around the country. So, there's a conclusion to draw from here. In order for someone to learn, they must learn as part of a collaborative project that involves all the interested parties. Psychology isn't just a teacher teaching a student. It involves the whole social context. And in order for that learning to be successful and socially relevant, everyone has to be involved. Otherwise, they're likely to shoot you down anyway. Or you'll educate the child and all will happen to them and they'll be left as a, a lonely person that doesn't get on with anyone else. So it is the, the, the school practices uh, which is the main thing uh, first to overcome and the, the participation in the whole community is essential to that. Now, Mike has done a, a lot of work trying to understand the context because all these things raise the context of learning. Um, this is the, a diagram that's characteristic of the work of Yuri Ronsenbrenner. And uh, in the early 70s, I think we're talking about, um, he introduced the idea of ecological validity and this is his definition of context. Yeah? The little circle in the middle is a microsystem that's you know, teacher and student together trying to get some learning happen. The blue oval is all the other uh, microsystems that are engaged and overlapping with that microsystem. Right? Like the relationship the family, for instance, is another microsystem that it's involved with the education and the the, that's the mesosystem. Then outside that you've got the exosystem, um, get the, the definition of exosystem, external environments which indirectly uh, influence development. So that might be the father's workplace. Yeah? And then outside that you've got the macro system, which is the whole you know, country, the political environment, the economy and so on. And actually outside that there's also a chrono system, which is the evolution of external systems over time. So I think this emphasises that uh, a definition of the context which leaves nothing out is just an open in totality. For example, uh, if I was part of some investigation of someone that wants to be ecologically valid and try and understand my psychology, they really at least have to bring, uh, go back to the um, mid-30s and the Spanish Civil War and the factors which influenced the development of my parents' personality. They would have to take them into account the Second World War and the baby boom which followed, which uh, you know, turned, put me on the sort of leading edge of a, uh, a, the baby boom. They would have to take account of McCarthyism, which led to things uh, like teachers treating me as a communist, even though I didn't even know what communism was in primary school, and how that affected the development of my personality. The sight of Sputnik going overhead, what was that, 1954 or something? And great, you know, our side can put one up there in the bloody Yanks cars. I mean, I could go on. All these things which were part of the development of the whole world are really important factors you know, in developing my uh, psychology. And I don't think anyone's any different in that sense. Different factors. Okay, so what use is it to tell you? Yeah, it's a reminder that it isn't all just contained in this immediate thing which is a focus your attention. The development of uh, the personality and learning uh, is determined by an open-ended totality around which you cannot draw a border. You can't draw a border around it. Here's some things from other people. Uh, this is René van der Veer. He's a very important early translator and uh, uh, promoter of Vygotsky. And he says, context is not just the physical and socio-economic environment with all the possibilities and tools it affords, but also the intellectual environment in the sense of affordable, so available ideas traditions of thinking, and so on. The physical, technological, socio-economical, and intellectual environments and their complex interdependence determines the individual's possibilities. Right? And he adds, what may be an inhospitable environment for one organism may be an El Dorado for another. So it's also a relative thing. You just can't take the, the here's the environment. For one person, it's a horror. For the other, I'll take Shangri-La. That would be my choice of metaphor. Okay? Again, it is in a sense expanding the concept of, of environment even more. You not only have to take the history of the entire world into account, you have to take the relation of that history to the person as well. To say that learning is dependent on the environment in this sense is really just a truism. It 
doesn't aid your understanding at all to know that everything is involved. We have to find some concept of the environment which is not going to magically unlock all the factors that are at play, but will give you some approach to know where to look, what to take into account, how to, to, to put next to each other the uh, various factors. Now, Wogowski's uh, word for this is situation. And it's situation in the sense like you have a situation room in the, in the uh, White House when you have these movies. Or when uh, you phone your mother and you say, Mum, Mum, I'm in a situation here. I ran out of petrol on the freeway and I've got the kids with me. Ah, okay. it's, that's what situation means. Okay. Um, you could argue about that, but in the context of reading how Wagotsky deals with it, that's what it is. It's a problem. Yeah? And that's really, um, I think it's a fantastic notion and it unlocks a lot of understanding in uh, uh, the development of a person, seeing their environment in terms of a concept namely a situation. It still doesn't deal with these larger questions of you know, uh, how the, the Russian Revolution affected uh, the development of a child in Russia 50 years later, for example. Okay? Now, um, the, another um, concept that Bogotsky uses is this perishivania. And he says, in a perishivania, we're always dealing with an individual unity of personal characteristics and situational characteristics which are represented in the parish Vanya. I think I deal with that yesterday. This is just to emphasize, uh, however you approach it, the, there's always the, the subjective side of it. Right? Just the same as I was saying, you have to know how the whole world history affects the person. And Vygotsky is saying a situation uh, for development is defined in relation to a person's relation to it. Okay? Now, um, Mike Cole says this, there is a, in the context of, of units of analysis, that is, working towards uh, trying to make a concept of a person's relation to the environment that allows you to understand learning. He says, there is a basic unit, or well, there must be, a basic unit common to the analysis of both cultures and individuals' psychological processes. And two, this unit consists of an individual engaged in goal-directed activity and the conventionalized constraints. This unit is variously designated as activity or a task or an event. So Mike's there making a reference to the notion of activity which we touched on yesterday in the work of Leontief. Um, my problem here with this concept is it's just really too vague. You know, it's an event or a task or an activity. Uh, but I mean, I fully agree with that paragraph of Mike's. It's, it's, it's a wonderful, sort of like a definition of the problem. Yeah? But we still have to solve the problem. So what I'm going to do uh, for this section, I'm going to go through six or seven theories that not necessarily anything to do with Vygotsky or Marxism or psychology for that matter, but they're different theories that uh, are out there um, to understand context. Uh, and I find that people that uh, use Vygotsky, usually supplement the Vygotsky with one of these theories right, in order to uh, be able to have a whole, a whole picture. Right? Okay, the first one I've got is um, just the concept of an environment. And here I don't mean um, that more developed uh, idea of ecology, but just the general idea of things existing in an environment and environment's important. Now, insofar as this concept exists in psychology, it's completely unconceptual. Right? It's understood as, a, as a, a list of factors of all the things that might affect a person. And insofar as it's used in psychology, uh, your mainstream positivist um, so psychologist simply lists out all the factors, does thousands of tests, puts them through some factor analysis and comes out with the relative importance of sibling order, you know, parental occupation, etc., etc., etc. This is no use to us. Right? It always only tells you what we already knew, but with a statistical significance rating on it. it can't, you can't learn anything from it. I'm going to go back again to our good friend um, Gadamar with his concept of tradition. Uh, and Gadamar tells us that tradition motivates, develops and restricts. Uh, this, is a, this is very helpful because what we are, uh, for instance, yesterday mostly looking for is the source of motivation. Yeah? So if we take the tradition, um, we find that that is a major source of motivation. 
not only that, the tradition is continually changing. Uh, chiefly while the tradition is defending certain things, as conditions change, it uh, lets other things which are regarded as only contingent go. So uh, over time, the tradition clarifies itself about what is essential and what's the bottom line. And the tradition also restricts, thou shalt not this, thou shalt not that, is part of a tradition. And so it's very determinative of uh, someone's learning processes and their experience. And as we know, um, the method of understanding a tradition or a text, or in, that, in other words, when we say text, because he's a literary critic, so to speak, he's a hermeneutic person, the way we as, as uh, uh, teachers and learners and activity theorists go, we understand instead of it as text, we have an act or an action. And to understand an action, to make sense of it, why are these kids failing to understand mathematics? Yeah? Something like that, it's also negative actions. Um, we have to uh, take the actions and try to build up a picture of the tradition and then having understood the tradition go back and reinterpret the actions and improve your understanding of the tradition and then go back again and examine the traditions until your conception of every action is commensurate with your conception of the tradition. Right? Then you, you know you've understood it. Next I'll go to genre. Uh, the, the, the theories of genre go back to antiquity. Yeah? They're mainly to do with uh, the methods of expression found in the literature and arts. And it uh, was made, uh, brought up to date, if you like, and introduced into 20th century philosophy, uh, mainly through Baxton, Mikhail Baxton, a, a contemporary of Vygotsky's in Russia. And uh, the genre is uh, determined by a set of rhetorical, a rhetorical situation. Okay? So it uh, defines how a person is treated by uh, an, an interlocutor. How is that? Um, and the skilled uh, rhetorical actor knows how to flip the uh, genre from one to another. You know, so you go up to challenge someone and then he responds and such interprets what you're saying as, as giving an excuse. And then you can interpret that back as an insult. Yeah? Um, and then the, the whole situation can be completely changed. And uh, the, 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 what creates the basis or defines the genre is called the frame, which is defined in Baxter's work as what surrounds uh, the genre. And so, although this is all coming out of literary criticism kind of stuff, this is really hot stuff for people in politics. Right? Because if, for instance, you're discussing uh, the welfare program, if it's framed as being about the, the budget deficit or workforce participation you, or goal bludging, you know, the need for discipline, um, you get one kind of debate. If, on the other hand, you, you frame it within uh, the problem of poverty, yeah, so you get a different result. So the frame determines the, the genre which will be, uh, in which the issue will be discussed. Yeah? The, the, the frame of, of how people are defined uh, determines their, the rules that are going to determine their actions. Right, so frame is a slightly deeper way of understanding a genre, um, which is a, a way of interpreting the context. It's a, it's a rhetorical or a context of discourse. Right? Uh, next, narrative. Um, when I, for instance, introduced the, or presented to you the concept of activity, in these talks, um, I didn't do it by giving you the definition of activity and then sort of elaborating on the, the, the properties of it and so on. I did it by narrative. I started back in the 18th century and r rattled through how this concept that starts off uh, as a fairly simple concept with a, a very clear and understandable reason for its introduction uh, to, to understand nature as something that's vital and living and contains you know, opposed forces and intention. And then you can follow the narrative and um, certainly Carol's remark to me uh, was that she couldn't really see what it was all about with activity. Why was this important? Why do we have to call it activity? And Mike Cole frequently has said to me, yeah, I understand about activity, and I don't, you know, what's it all about? Activity is activity. Why is it such a big philosophical word? But when you put that word into a narrative, yeah, uh, then it makes sense. Ah, that's why, you know, people talk about activity. So narrative is a really important way of understanding the context. 
that if you make a person, uh, you put them in the context of their, their upbringing and their family and their predecessors, yeah, no wonder he's like that. Right? If you put um, uh, some kind of situation, oh yeah, the, the question of Marx's uh, 18th Brumaire, his uh, analysis of the history of uh, the uprisings in France in the uh, 1848 and thereabouts, um, he talks about how political leaders uh, or political personages come onto the scene and cast themselves in the role of a, of a Napoleon or a role of a, a Roman emperor or something to make uh, themselves look heroic and then gather around them a support base which, uh, of people that identify with that picture. Right? So they, they create the context, uh, create really a drama and then uh, act out together uh, a new uh, telling of the drama in which they jointly improvise the results as they go along, except it's real, of course. Right? Um, okay. Um, next, discourse. Now, discourse is really a way of understanding an institution. Re really, as I see it, discourse and institution are the same thing, right? but it emphasizes the uh, way our institutions in society are day by day, constructed and reconstructed, and the power of discourse, the introduction of new concepts into a discourse, the renaming of things, the struggle to eliminate certain words from a discourse, um, how this uh, can transform conditions, transform and destroy institutions and create new ones. Uh, so it has a, it's a very subversive concept. Right? It also, which I like, it emphasised the fragility of our institutions. And like the events in, uh, talk about fragility, the events going on in the Arab world at the moment, how you know, all is calm, all is hell the next day. Right? How fragile that is. And how uh, if someone tips the discourse in some way, um, the whole environment changes. So it's a very powerful way of understanding context. Then we've got field. Uh, this is a concept I take from uh, Pierre Bourdieu, who's a very, very interesting uh, French philosopher or sociologist, and is one that quite a few Vygotsky people use as their, their other half. You know? oh, I'm for Vygotsky and Bourdieu, because you know? uh, he deals really with these very structural kind of issues. And what a field is, is um, uh, basically an institution which offers certain rewards so, for instance, the university is a field, and if you do the right things, publish the right number of papers, you get promoted, uh, you get to be head of department, uh, you get respect, you get extra pay, and so on. Right? So that determines all the activity uh, within the university, the various rewards that are offered to people. Right? Um, and it's a powerful insight uh, into uh, the context of someone's actions. And it doesn't have to be official institution. Um, uh, Dorothy Holland, as a, as a Vygotsky uh, has sort of rebranded uh, Bourdieu's terms, and she calls a field a figured world. Right? But it's basically the same idea. And there's a book she wrote, which is a great book, uh, where she analyzes the uh, field of romance among some college students, how they're competing with each other, and the rewards they get for you know, finding a good boyfriend, and the risks they take, and, and, the, and all that kind of thing. I mean, I have a problem with this, really. I mean, um, it gives you certain insights into the context of someone's action and a way of understanding it, but it's very objectivist. How, you know, how could you... I mean, it's one thing to be a researcher there with your notepad, you know, taking notes of what people do uh, and, and, and establishing, you know, say, romance as a field. But can you describe your own motivation that way? Oh, I'm going to this field and you know, I'm going to compete according to these rules and get a partner and I'll be more highly respected. No, it's totally objective. It's very good at looking at people as basically little robots. That, oh, what I was saying, it's like uh, one of these films, you know, where the aliens come down and, and get into people's bodies and have little glowing eyes. Walking uh, it's like that. It, it, the people aren't treated as human beings. But it does give you insights into motivation, a, con a way, a context. Okay, and the, the one, the, all these different approaches to conceptualising a context have their power. Yeah? You should turn your back on none of them. You need every uh, tool 
theoretical tool at hand to try and understand context. Maybe you don't have a chance to you know, get into seven different sort of fields of social theory, but whatever you can to use them, I don't ever be seen to be putting them down. But if you uh, into activity theory and Vygotsky, there is a problem if we use one range of concepts to understand uh, social life on, on, in the large, and another set of concepts to understand individual life and, and uh, social interactions on a smaller scale. Because what that does, it reinforces and cements the conception that we all get in this world we live in of, on the one hand, this little world at home and so on, where we have some control over events and we are participants. On the other hand, the great world out there, where we have no say whatsoever, which is like force and nature. And I think that's very unfortunate because if we're going to conceive of context, we don't want to have present context just as the, the, the passive uh, out of field limiting and determining what people do. Because people, as I mean Mark says, and this is on Feuerbach, something to the effect of, of who changes conditions. Now, it's people that change conditions. So if you have a conception of the, the larger social context that does not uh, include uh, it isn't constructed an understanding of these being, this context being something that's constructed by human beings and who are themselves subjects of psychology and think about what they're doing and feel about what they're doing, that you are actually reinforcing the major problem you have today is a rupture of uh, people into an atomic existence of each individual family, if they're lucky to have a family on their own, uh, on, one, on the other side. On the other side, vast uh, processes of, of nations trampling on other nations, and, and being people being crushed by uh, laws and bureaucracy and so on. We have a definite need for uh, a, a concept which uh, is equally useful, as Mike Cole said in that quote, for people and for the institutions of society. Okay. Now, those of you who have been listened to me a couple of times probably uh, know where I'm going. I made a slide of that. Okay. Once we set up a dichotomy between the individual and the societal context at the level of theoretical genre, we cement in place a dichotomy people feel in their lives, and which is very disabling. So uh, you know that I'm going from here to collaborative projects. The, the claim here is that the appropriate way to understand context is with a unit, let's just say a concept, of, the, of what the, con the larger context is made up of. In other words, a unit of social life, which I'm proposing to be taken as a collaborative project. The unit of intellectual life remains joint artifact-mediated action. But we have to join that together with a unit of social life. Um, so that when we say, for instance, joint artifact-mediated medi action, we need some criterion for understanding what that jointness is. What does it mean by joint? Is uh, working under your boss's direction joint? Yeah. It is um, uh, buying something of someone who's produced it for you. Is that joint action? Right? So the notion of collaboration gives us a handle on how to understand jointness. And when we talk about action being mediated, likewise, we need this concept of a collaborative project to actually uh, get a sensible understanding of what joint artifact mediated action is. And of course also gives you uh, the uh, handle on the larger social context. So we don't separate individual life and psychology and, uh, and contain, can create a separate set of laws, laws of history, social laws and sociological categories which aren't connected with people and somehow or other stand outside of others. Now, the, the collaborative project is both subjective and objective. Right? But the project gives you an insight into the motivation of people who decide to join a project. The, we don't set up motivation as a separate category that pre-exists psychology or learning or project. The project itself is the realisation of a concept. The, the, at a certain point, a project seems to be driven by a certain ideal, like Gadamer's tradition. Sorry. As time goes on, uh, a different thing is realised. 
Right? So the ideal actually arises out of the activity of the project. Okay? It gives us the real motivation, it realizes the motivation of the people involved. This is very good because what we need to avoid is the uh, sociological position of taking a God's eye view. This is a phrase we use where you describe something as if you sat in God's seat and looked down on the world and described what you saw. We, abs- we live in the world, we are participants in the world, the world is changed by our activity. And we, if we are learning, not just for the sake of producing books and uh, you know, becoming famous, but if we're thinking in relation to ourselves what we're going to do, and we're communicating our ideas to other people who want to do something, then we need a concept which is both subject and object. Uh, and uh, putting it another way, a project is a real narrative. Uh, so it shares a lot with the idea of narrative. But it's not just a story told, which enters into the psyche, whether it's a myth or uh, a piece of real history, it's a a real living narrative, (coughs) which people involved uh, are participating in. Because a project uh, is the process of realisation of the concept. Uh, An observation that uh, Mike Cole made was that the word context originates from uh, the Latin word contextera, which means to weave together. So uh, again, you know, I feel myself anticipated by uh, Mike's work. He wrote that, uh, I think in 1997, that context means to weave together. Okay? Um, so we understand the fabric of society as being intertwining, interlocking, uh, projects, making up the fabric of society. Now, I'd just like to make an aside here that part of my objective is to use Vygotsky's ideas as a means of interpreting and bringing uh, to life, so to speak, the philosophy of Hegel. But at the same time, the aim is then to release uh, the philosophical insights of Hegel, which are enormous, someone that spent their whole life uh, thinking philosophically, whereas poor old Vygotsky spent his life uh, recovering from tuberculosis, uh, staying under the, the gunfire of the Stalinist police, and uh, eventually, you know, after 10 years of productive work, uh, was got by the TV. I mean, Hagen had a long life, and his works... I mean, another reason for trying to bring Vygotsky and Hagen together is, frankly, uh, Vygotsky studies, or the Vygotsky based psychology is a small minority. We know we've got it all right and everyone else is up the creek, but we're still a minority, Vygotsky's school. Whereas we share respect for Hegel uh, with a whole range of different currents of political science, philosophy, social theory, and everything. So that if we can bring Hegel to life and make it easy to understand and powerfully relevant today, we create a late relationship and a possibility for collaboration with a hell of a lot of other researchers. You know, in the philosophy department, in the social theory department, in the sociolog- sociology department, who have never heard of Vygotsky. But maybe if they could see how Hegel makes sense, because you know, if I say a, project, a process, sorry, a project is a process in which a concept is realised, I mean, that's pure Hegel, right? But it's translated into some common words. Because for Hegel, the concept wasn't just uh, something that a, a thought form, a concept was a form of activity organized around some artifact and with some real individuals participating. Yeah. So, uh, this is part of my objective to try and, and bring Hegel to life uh, through the body of Vygotsky's work, thereby giving Hegel a really substantial base. So he's not just talking about mind with a capital M, you know, marching across the earth and so on, doing this and that as something that exists outside human beings, but on practical, psychological work that people like you guys do, and to test it out and try it out. So this is a huge advantage for someone that's interested in bringing to life the very profound insights of Hegel. And just a final observation, oh yeah, that's me. Okay. Uh, pointing out, making real, yeah, 1966, much younger than 20. Uh, um, my point here is to uh, 
look at the ethical aspects of collaboration. Huh? I'm, I'm burning my draft card. First in the state to do so as well. Okay. We, but we won't see this if we have this objectivist vision. I mean, to an objectivist, there were you know, certain sociological factors going on in Melbourne at the time that this young character decided to burn his draft card. Yeah, it explains nothing. It certainly wouldn't get me out to do it. You know, having some sociologist explain the material conditions to maybe do that. Um, so, you know, an individual has an impact. Yeah? Uh, by the time I left the country a few months later, I, mean, I left the country, got the hell out of it, I didn't function in military prison. But thousands of people were doing this. Yeah? So it, 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 we changed our own condition. I didn't do it on my own, I couldn't do it on my own, I could, to burn a draft card. But in order for it to have a social impact, I joined a group called Youth Campaign Against Inscription. As it turned out, it was a Communist Party front, but I didn't know that. Uh, for the only person within a hundred yard radius that didn't know that, but I didn't anyway. Um, it had to be done as a collaborative project. I just could not have done that on my own. Okay? So a collaborative project carries with it its, uh, not only its normative weight as to how you should do it, you know, how you need to consult people and work together and make decisions together, it also creates an identity. Because, you know, I'm an old guy now and I don't do anything like this anymore, but I still relate to it, you know? You know, it was me that started all that in, in my part of the world, and I, I, I relate to that. Um, I, I wrote a, a little piece for a uh, book, people were collecting um, what called, recollections about hitchhiking. I wrote a little sort of story for this, my, my adventure hitchhiking in um, Europe, and I showed it to a friend and said, What do you make? And he said, oh, The courage. Yeah, because I would waltz up to a border uh, and uh, like get, not let in because I had long hair and then sort of walk around the border post and walk in. Uh, well, that's crazy, crazy stuff. You know? And you really have to be crazy in a way to do something like that as well. But that's how the world works. So it's collaborative project gives you an identity. What are you? I'm part of this party. Or I'm one of these people who don't believe in so and so or whatever. Um, it also gives you agency because the fact is I couldn't do that on my own. I certainly couldn't keep out of the army on my own. You had to make a project with other people and find other people who would go along with that in order to do anything in the world. Right? And as I said, a project is a realised narrative. So those are people, great people like Ernest Farr, that identify uh, narratives of the development of identity. Yes, but it's not enough for a narrative to simply be a myth. Because yeah? uh, myths are only usually, if not directly, indirectly, reflecting real narratives, projects perhaps from the past. So uh, I hope I've explained and brought out the um, problem in the understanding of context uh, and the need uh, for something like a collaborative project to be the chosen means of trying to stitch together an understanding of the context, to weave together an understanding of context. So, Thank you. It's just gone 3.30. Thank you very much for coming.